That was an exciting countdown. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we are pleased to uh, be joined by our next duo of presenters, Nettie Harper and Kelly Gilligan, who together are the co-founders of Inspired Memory Care Incorporated. They will present on the topic of living through a pandemic, the long-term physical and social impact on care partner dyads. Let me tell you a little bit about each presenter. Uh, Nettie Harper, for over 20 years, Nettie has been a leader in the fields of memory care and recreation therapy, securing New York State grants to improve the quality of dementia care services in skilled nursing facilities and developing globally implemented training programs for some of the most well-regarded memory care programs in Florida and New York. And Kelly Gilligan, from a very young age, uh, has had the privilege of being inspired by older adults. Her education began with the very best instructors, two generations of live-in grandparents and great-grandparents, and they sparked her passion for the field of geriatrics. Over the past 15 years, she has served as a director and educator in the field of memory care. Through her experience, she has honed an holistic approach to partnering with individuals who are living with memory impairment and their care teams, and a dedication to improving the field through well-designed educational experiences. Uh, Nettie and Kelly, welcome. We are eager to hear from you both. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, just gonna take a moment to share my screen with everyone. And Kelly, do you see the screen, please? I do see the screen. All right, let me just bring my video back up and then we will get started. One moment. One second. Okay, all set, Kelly? Yep. Okay, here we go. First of all, we just want to start with a huge thank you, and that thank you goes to several people. We'd first like to thank the New Jewish Home for collaborating to pull this day together. We know it's no easy uh, feat, and this is just a testament to the innovative work that care professionals and organizations are continuing to provide to support their colleagues, and their clients. Secondly, we would like to thank the professionals and family care partners that are joining us today. We also know that's not an easy feat, um, spending a day going to a conference. And so we'd like to thank you for your, again, innovative work, but also the quick pivoting you were able to do to support individuals living with cognitive and or physical impairments. Kelly and I were able to witness and participate in some of these innovative approaches that surfaced as the Reverend said, over the past 21 months, not only to support our clients and families, but to support our colleagues as well. And I think that's important to mention because we often had to support each other through uh, this 21 months. We are appreciative to be here today to share some of the impacts on care partner dyads of living through this pandemic as we continue to live through. All right, so what we're gonna talk about in the next, this session currently, is we actually had the opportunity to really read through a lot of research and we identified what some of the negative trends were. And this was across the world. We didn't only just focus in New York City, but we focused in other countries as well. And we found some trends. And we also found some positive trends. And again, it goes back to that thank you. You need to commend yourself for the work that you did to support through the 21 months. And we're also going to share some insights on the learning from our colleagues, our family care partners, and clients about moving forward and being proactive to care partnering. And lastly, we're going to share many resources for you to download. If you've seen Kelly and I speak before, yes, we're going to present what the issues are. We're going to present the pros and the cons, but we want to leave you with how do we move forward? And we have a wealth of resources that are there to support. So we want to share those with you as well. 
And so from the beginning, there were restrictions and they were harsh. We had a lack of immediate information about what was going on. We had a lack of supports. So all of a sudden we had unability, unability to paid caregivers, home care agencies, companions that we had in place in the home. And they were unavailable to our family care partners because number one, they didn't have the information. So there was fear, but also sometimes our paid caregiver was ill. And so what do we do in those emergency situations? We also had a restriction of the typical support, such as um, healthcare providers, you know, your primary care physician, your neurologist, your adult day programs. We had the eye-opening reality of how important our adult daycare programs are and the many volunteers that we use to support individuals living with cognitive or physical uh, disabilities. And we also had in-person support groups. There were organizations that were already online, but some weren't, and those, those were taken away. Yes, quickly people pivoted, but in the initial shock of it, we all kind of had this paralysis and then we had to move forward. And Kelly and I also experienced that. Much of our work was always in person. And so we had to kind of go through that paralysis state too. Like, what do we do? We have clients we need to support. How do we pivot with this? The other thing that was extremely important and it was brought up in a lot of the research that Kelly's gonna share with you is our informal support groups. And that means our neighbors, our neighborhood, even just, you know, sandwiches that we would always get at the bodega and we had that communication with people. That's very like supportive in our daily routine here in New York City when you see these people on a regular basis, right? So our informal support groups mean a lot to us in our day to day. And then almost immediate inaccessibility to senior communities. So family care partners who really relied to go see their loved one on a daily basis, yes, to see their loved one, but guess what happens? They all became a community. So families would visit with families, family would visit with other residents there. It is a huge community amongst an assisted living or independent senior living or our rehabs and skilled nursing facilities. And that was almost immediately inaccessible. And then of course, it brings on that isolation. We really didn't understand what was happening. And so we all did hunker down and there just wasn't a lot of um, supports already online. And so we were isolated in our homes. So this next video, Kelly, you're gonna share a little bit about it before we get started. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, just building on the theme of caregivers today, hearing the voices of caregivers is truly crucial to the work that we do. Um, as caregivers, sharing our experiences can bring knowledge to others and, and bring that sense of solidarity to others. But as professionals, and, and I have gotten the opportunity to wear both hats at this point, um, as professionals, really listening and looking to the caregivers as sources of innovation and sources of advocacy. Um, it's a crucial piece of the work that we're doing. And even through this pandemic, I know this concept of hope and moving forward, um, there's still a lot of ambiguity there, but doing some reflective listening and, and bringing those messages forward is important. So we have a video. It was a really, really well done video by PBS NewsHour kind of highlighting the voices of caregivers. We didn't have time to share the entire peace with you. Um, but it begins with hearing from care partners to older adults, care partners to children with physical disabilities or autism, um, a woman who is a spouse to a husband living with disability and PTSD, um, and what their experiences have been like. And then we're actually going to pivot and move to hearing about um, some of the advocacy and, and the need for initiative amongst caregivers. So, Nettie, if you want to go ahead and, and hit play, we can hear from, uh, hear from our folks from PBS. Okay, and Kelly, as soon as the video starts, if you could just give me a thumbs up that you hear the sound, that would be great. Absolutely. And for a deeper look at the toll that this pandemic has taken on our nation's caregivers, Judy Woodruff spoke recently with Dr. Jennifer Olson. She's executive director of the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. Jennifer Olson, welcome to the news hour. These stories from caregivers, people who take care of others, 
um, they're, it's just overwhelming. It takes your breath away. And, and they're normally the kinds of stories we don't hear. I mean, these, these happen in the privacy of families. You're right. The stories we just heard are often bedroom or kitchen table conversations, despite the fact that there are over 50 million caregivers in this country. And that was the number before COVID. Give us a sense of the range of things caregivers are called on to do and what it can mean when the day knows no end. Yeah, I mean, I think what we have heard is increases in stress in this time of COVID with a couple of main drivers. Fears about someone getting sick themselves so they wouldn't be able to provide the care that we, they, they do for others. Individuals worried about their care recipient getting sick. Lack of access to services, as we just heard, people unable to come into the home or day programs not being available. Last week, we released a report, Caregivers in Crisis, which is a hard read, but not surprising. Over 80% of the caregivers we talked to mentioned this increased stress, as well as fears about a lack of ability to go for medical treatments or appointments that they were expecting to bring their loved one to. So the stress is compounding. And the work that these caregivers do, it's not as if they can be socially distanced. I mean, they are doing some of the most personal uh, kinds of help that you can imagine. That's right. I think many caregivers had created structures that gave them respite or breaks. Even the drive to the grocery store provided a moment of break or returning to their caregiver role, those breaks aren't as available. The services that people relied on for people who came into your home, not as available. Just an ongoing list of reasons that things are becoming more challenging. You, the Rosalind Carter Institute, have called this an emergency room moment uh, for caregiving. What did you mean by that? I'm a public health person, and in public health, we constantly try to keep people out of the emergency room whether through prevention or education and awareness campaigns or mild treatment options. Unfortunately, caregivers tend to reach out for help or get support when they're at their stress point, when they're experiencing physical or mental health ailments themselves. I think this is the point for the country to see that caregivers, if supported, won't get to those stress points won't show up in that emergency room of their caregiver journey. What can be done about it? I mean, these are, it's not as simple as the government um, passing one law. I mean, these are people, again, it's in the, it's in the family, it's children, it's the elderly, it's, um, it's so many different kinds of circumstances. What are the kinds of things that would help them? Our work for caregivers will require an engagement on thinking at the population level about policies and programs as well as listening to and learning from individual caregiver stories. But you're right, Judy, this is gonna take an effort amongst different sectors, employers engaging directly, legislators and lawmakers, health departments, social service departments, and community organizations working to see caregivers. How often are caregivers thought of? Not nearly enough. We don't engage in caregiver conversations at many boardrooms and companies across this country nor in the hallways of governments at the federal and state level. And that's the change that we're calling for. Across this country, there have been caregivers who have immune compromised loved ones that they've figured out innovative solutions for, whether that's drive-through services or drop-offs. So wouldn't it be amazing if we started to look to caregivers as the problem solvers that they are and to learn from them? Well, there's no question they are doing extraordinary work, as you say, for millions and millions of Americans. Jennifer Olson with the Rosalind Carter Caregiving Institute, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Judy. Kelly? And so those numbers of caregivers um, amongst us are staggering, right? It's, it's staggering to think of the number of people that are care partners and how they've had to pivot and do things that they've never done before, ostomies. Some have been doing wound care when they didn't have accesses, access to those services, catheter care, injections, um, and, and all while trying to keep the spirits up and not having the opportunity necessarily that they had previously to step outside their role. So 
We're going to speak more in depth about the effects of isolation on both individual care partners and care partner dyads. Um, and when we say dyads, we're talking about pairs and then how folks are working to kind of transcend the situations that they're in successfully and what those successes have been. I think there's one other important point I just want to draw out is that you know, when it said um, we're not talking about caregivers in the boardrooms and, you know, that we found that over the years too, Kelly, and I feel like if more companies might have been talking about it earlier, it might have been more supportive. So if you have, I know most of the people on here are um, in the healthcare profession or now they are because they're family care partners and so forth, but we've got to bring it to a company level as well because I bet a lot of companies didn't even know that they had full-time or part-time caregivers that worked for them as well. And it wasn't until this pandemic happened that they had to address it. So we're gonna talk a lot about being proactive because guess what? We're still living it. And once we are done with this pandemic, something else is gonna happen. That's just the way the world works, right? So let's be proactive in our actions. And part of that is talking to the current caregivers about the planning. We don't have all the answers. We need to involve them. So when uh, we're talking about isolation, what we found is that in the general population, COVID-19, the quarantine has had negative psychological effects such as boredom, frustration, anger, anxiety, and stress. And I myself, as, as well as I'm sure all of you, have lived through all those emotions as well and continuing to live through them. And this was echoed amongst care partners as well. There was actually a study that we found that they surveyed 4,913 informal caregivers of persons living with dementia and they found that they reported a significant increase in anxiety, depression, which we know depression can have some long-term effects as well, distress and what that does to our physical health and irritability from the pandemic. And there were three overall arching themes throughout the survey of these individuals was that they felt a loss of control, they had uncertainty, and then how am I adapting to this new normal? So we need to understand that these health effects of isolation are still continuing and they're gonna have some long-term effects. The increase of the home confinement increased the risk of caregiver burnout by 10%. And Kelly, you and I just saw a care partner this week and she said, I'm done. I feel awful for saying it, but I can't do it anymore, right? So it says to me, while she does have resources, she needs more. And does she have somebody she can speak to openly about it, right? So if she already got to us and she's done, we've got to do a little bit better. And again, in the very beginning, I think all the work that all the care professionals did because there was just so much to overcome, but we're not done yet. And that's the hard part. The time of isolation was actually significantly associated with the severity of depression symptoms among informal caregivers. Anything else you want to say about that one, Kelly? No, I, nope. I think just the <laughs> role overload piece is an important piece. And then in looking at the research, there were several factors that really compounded the stress, um, particularly for care partners of individuals living with cognitive change. Um, number one, the pandemic increased the stakes for avoiding adverse events like falls. Um, whereas a fall could be catastrophic historically, avoiding hospitalizations, um, avoiding the need for uh, a, a skilled rehab or nursing stay for fear really led care partners to do everything at all costs to preserve safety, which if you've ever partnered for care for somebody living with cognitive change, you kind of learn to predict the unpredictable. And so it's, it causes a state of almost hypervigilance. Um, it also, for many of, I, I speak for myself in this, 
led to delays in treatment, both for the individual care partner and the person living with dementia. I can remember um, early on, Nettie, we did a presentation with uh, a dentist on the importance of oral care and, and the implications of oral care for overall health. Um, and, and I remember thinking, my goodness, the last thing I, I had wanted to do during the pandemic is, is go to the dentist and open my mouth and be breathing on someone or be breathed on. Um, however, it's <laughs> I see you smiling and laughing. I don't want to be breathing on someone in general, but particularly in that scenario. Um, so things that might normally have gotten more proactive treatment, like a urinary tract infection, ended up being delayed. And unfortunately, in situations like that, we may see such uh, instances of delirium. Um, you and I saw a number of people who had podiatry concerns because they didn't have access to podiatry and it was affecting their overall gaits. So what are seemingly smaller services that may seem a little bit less important had these larger implications for individuals that perhaps we didn't think so much about. Um, the impact of critical care or even advanced care planning decisions. Um, it, it certainly has caused people to pivot in their thoughts about advanced care planning. And I heard um, Reverend Harper mention kind of that stigmatization of, of older adults and how their health doesn't necessarily have the same, hold the same weight or the same value as the health of younger adults. And, and thinking about that and, and internalizing those types of messages can be really, really traumatic. Um, on top of that, we heard a lot about the total loss of routine for individuals living with cognitive change. Um, many of the care partners that we work with rely heavily on routine and structure to support folks with their physical and neuropsychological symptoms. Um, and so we have certainly seen a spike in things like hallucinations or delusions amongst care partners who were isolated. Um, I, Reverend Harper again mentioned selective disengagement, and I think of that constant barrage of the media and images of PPE on the news constantly. At one point, even the refrigeration trucks. For an individual living with cognitive change, viewing those images over time can certainly feed into neuropsychological symptoms. I think it feeds into neuropsychological symptoms for most of us is what we're seeing. Um, so uh, another major issue that we've heard about due to the lack lack of routine is sleep disturbance. Um, many folks living with cognitive change, with that loss of social rhythm and the spike of anxiety, they lose those kind of zeitgeists that we rely on. And with the lack of activities and sleep loss, we can see delirium. Um, so that can also increase morbidity and even mortality for folks living with dementia. Um, and then the thing that I think you and I have heard of over and over again is that sense of nagging in the relationship between care partners. It's hard enough living in isolation um, in, a, in a spousal relationship or, or even in any relationship, um, but unfortunately for people living with cognitive change and their care partners, there may be some behaviors that are a little bit more um, escalated or magnified. And when you're living on top of one another, that sense of nagging without a buffering third party, like a companion or a, even a physical therapist coming in, can bring things to a head. When we looked at the research, a very significant factor um, in outcomes for quality of life and, and for couples particularly was a differential diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. And when we think of hallucinations, when we think of delusions, folks living with dementia with Lewy bodies in general are at a much higher risk. So I think that was another element of the research that really stood out. And I think it reflects our experience too, Nat. Yes, absolutely. And also just drawing back that when you said they didn't have kind of that third party buffer, I think we also take for granted that when the third parties come in, such as a geriatric care manager, such as a physical therapist or the companion or the home attendant, it was a little bit of respite for the family care partner that they truly needed. And I don't think that they actually saw it in that way sometimes before. They were truly missed and there's a new appreciation about those professionals. Absolutely. Was, I think it, that was across literature that we read that. Yep. And I think what, what maybe the literature didn't catch is sometimes there's respite for the person living with dementia too, right? They need a little respite from their care partner. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Kelly? 
And then what we also saw in the literature, and, and this has obviously had a tremendous amount of media coverage in certain capacities, are disparities of access. Um, marginalized groups, persons of color, persons living with dementia, persons with physical disabilities. Um, I think about, Nettie, some of the homebound folks that we've worked with in our, in our work with the MLTC. There are multiple barriers to service. Um, for loved ones and for themselves. Um, and we anticipate barriers to service sometimes in rural communities, um, right? I, I remember you sharing um, the research you saw about how rural Virginia handles food distribution. Do you wanna kind of share that research? We're, we're gonna get to that in just a few. Got it, okay. Um, but, but in certain capacities, Manhattan and, and the New York City area, despite being urban, despite being so connected, we were not prepared um, to respond to a crisis like this. And we need to explore why. Was it an issue of who we were prioritizing? Was it an issue of where the funding was? Um, what can we do better with planning and logistics? I look at, my husband is a teacher, and I look at how quickly the school systems were called upon to transition and pivot to the online forum. I look at how quickly they were called upon to implement full school days for the kids, um, how the mental health of parents and children was talked about. Districts were ordering laptops and tablets. They were mailing out paper packets until they were prepared to supply the technology. I don't know that we saw the same rapid response amongst older adults. Um, I know we spoke about day programs. They are truly such a cru crucial service. Um, and several of them did well. And Nettie, I know you're gonna share stories of a few of them, but over, overall, um, that you did not see the media coverage, you did not see the attention and the advocacy in, in those areas that you saw for, for instance, the education system. Absolutely. And just going back to um, the urban versus rural areas, yes, there was um, a rural, in rural Virginia, a city, and they were taught, and it sticks out in my mind because I know how hard New York City worked, but there were parts where we just missed it. And in this particular place, um, there were people that were given microwaves to help them better assist with their nutrition, whereas oftentimes we would see um, that some of the things that were handed out to um, our elders or New Yorkers in certain areas, it was like snack food rather than meals. And so not to, and by the way, this is, we saw so many things in so many organizations and so many companies hit the mark, but I just wanted to mention, you know, I, I saw it differently, handing out a microwave versus the foods, and I just thought that was pretty powerful that they were able to spring into action and pivot that quickly. Other things that we saw, we're just going to, we're going to call out a few organizations that just were just wonderful in their pivoting is um, immediately we saw the director of um, recreational resources and things of that sort for AFA, Alzheimer's Foundation of America. Jackie went right online virtually and they developed programs for every day. And I thought that was so, um, so important because AFA reaches a very wide span across the world. And it was so important that, you know, that that recreation, that engagement was still happening. Yes, it was virtual, but I have to tell you the pivot was like at the snap of your fingers. And I know so much hard work went into that. Another organization, a PACE organization, Centerlight, not only was reaching out to their participants, but also reaching out and asking, I, I know um, Reverend Harper had said something about we're becoming like this, this worker that's able to do so many facets of everybody's job because we had to pivot, we had to step up to the plate. And so they had social workers, they had, they had their transportation team going and into people's homes, greeting them with food. They developed a food pantry. So they went beyond what they normally do because they saw the need. And that's so many people did that. And I think that's to be commended. We have resilience. And I think it's important to acknowledge the good work that we saw people doing. But again, we're going to have to learn from this because we can't stop. Anything else you want to add there, Kelly? You want to do the first part? I'll do the second.
Pardon me. So when we looked at the research about positive aspects of caregiving, because certainly caregiving has its tedium, but there are many things that keep us invested and, and that are transcendent about caregiving. Um, before COVID-19, many individuals reported role satisfaction as care partners and gratitude for the experience of caring. There are tremendous emotional rewards that can come from caring. Um, there was personal growth that comes from caring. Sometimes as a care partner, you overcome obstacles and you, you problem solve in ways you never thought yourself <laughs> capable of doing. And I think that also speaks to that, that competence and mastery. Um, when you get really, really wonderful at doing something that you never expected to need to do, it, it truly it's builds wonderful. on your esteem, it builds on your identity. Um, I think Reverend Harper spoke a great deal to the opportunities for faith and spiritual growth. And then also the sense of duty and reciprocity. You know, I, I think to my own experience as a care partner and my grandmother gave me baths in a, in a kitchen sink and at her end of life, I had the opportunity to reciprocate that. And, and that's something that I will always hold on to. Um, and Nettie, do you wanna to speak to the unexpected benefits during COVID-19? Yes, absolutely. And there's just, there's, there's still much more research to be done, but there's a lot of research talking about pre-COVID and being a care partner and versus after. And actually in most of the studies, several participants were reporting gratitude for their experiences during COVID-19. I'll be honest, I wasn't exactly expecting that. Um, it enabled them to develop close relationships with their person living with dementia and other family members and even eventually paid caregivers who provided much needed socialization. And so I thought that was important to mention because again, we are hearing there are so many negative things that you know happen with COVID-19 and we lost a lot of family, a lot of colleagues, a lot of clients. And you know, as the Reverend Harper said, it's gonna take time and space and figuring out where everybody is in this relationship with you know this pandemic. So we are time and space, I can't say it enough, is it's what's needed, but also understanding that there were some unexpected benefits. The other thing that I really enjoyed reading is caregivers reported consistency that local area agencies on aging checked on them more often than before. I love to hear that because to me, what I'm seeing is that's gonna be a takeaway. Um, somebody had asked uh, Reverend Harper if they're going to continue the online streaming in those programs. I think that we will see that some of the things that we actually um, implemented during this pandemic, we will keep because we found out that it works and sometimes works even better and reaches a wider group of people. Okay. So these are some uh, statements that uh, have come out of some of the research that I had read, and I thought it was very interesting because it broke it down between pre-COVID, during COVID, and then moving forward. And these are from family care partners. And it says social activities. She has one friend who's a friend of mine who always would go and see her sort of like once a month. Then during COVID, YouTube's actually pretty good. There's all sorts of lessons people can do on any of the things they're interested in, and it gets you away from the news. And in this particular situation, um, one of the care partners said, I started him, the person living with dementia, off knitting these beanies for something different to get him away from the TV. And because the kids are coming up on Friday, he is madly knitting so that he can have them finished in time. I've been knitting them jumpers and he's making the beanies to go with the jumpers. I found that so inspiring. And again, maybe that's something they continue moving forward. So we're moving forward. Yeah, I think some of the same strategies that we've done to deal with mom, certainly we'd continue those, such as more constant phone contact. There's lots of interactions that we have between us as a family that we will continue for sure. And then just in the family category, we've made a decision we each go once a week and we call her every day. So once every three days, one of us would go. And then we have during COVID. Do you know what? I think sharing care with siblings has probably got better in some ways. Me, it's quite clear what my role is. And then moving forward, COVID forced an intense relationship with them, both parents living with dementia, but I wouldn't give it up now. So I think, you know, when we're reflecting back, we need to look at 
you know, pre-COVID, during COVID and moving forward, and then going back and referencing that PBS, the caregivers, let's ask the caregivers what their needs are, what could have been better, how do we move forward, what are we going to keep in place? They're the ones who are fantastic problem solvers. Kelly? Okay, so as we move forward, and I do see that there's a there is a comment or a question in the um, chat box that that applies to this. Yes, we do want to do a review, and and the goal for for us is to share the caregiver voices and and create opportunities for learning. Um, what lessons there have been, what successes have there been, what have we not done well, um, and what are the implications for direct care planning and policy moving forward. So thank you, you kind of fed right into <laughs> where we're hoping to go with this. Okay, going to move it forward, Kelly. Sounds good. All right, and so what we're going to do in this next section of our presentation is look over what are some of the lessons that have been learned. Um, we'll talk about contingency planning. We'll talk about linkage to resources. Um, Nettie, I, I know in home activities and leisure, it, it came up over and over again. And I feel like for you, it was vindication because for years, <laughs> you've been talking about engagement as treatment and how crucial it is for people to be engaged across the lifespan. Um, and then promoting caregiver health and well being. We knew it before, we really know now how important it is. And we'll also talk a bit about considerations of physical space and environment. Okay. Okay. So being prepared, we learned that being prepared is not what we thought prepared was, all right? So one of the things that first happened, um, you know, we have to admit there are, we're not through this. And as I mentioned earlier, something else could happen, another pandemic. I hope not, but this is the reality that we're living in. And so with this experience, we understand that we've got to be better proactive uh, collaborators. And one of the organizations we are so grateful to work with is a health home. They work with individuals who are underserved and they work with people that are living with disabilities, independence care system. And immediately they were one of the first organizations that I saw pivot so quickly. It was all hands on deck, including Kelly and I. Part of being a consultant is whatever is needed, you go out and you do it. And so what they did is they started noticing that um, our home attendants, they were getting COVID. Our home attendants, they were fearful of the travel, especially here in New York City. They're taking the subway, okay? So we needed what happens when your paid caregiver doesn't show up. And so we were calling and we had thousands of members to call to make sure that if an attendant did not show up, is there a backup plan? And as I mentioned, these are individuals living with severe disabilities or cognitive disabilities. And so string, stepping into action and collaborating together. And when we say a potential, um, potential backup plan, you might have to lean on other family members, neighbors, clergy, members of your support group, et cetera. And Kelly, do you want to share about the support bubbles that you learned about in the UK? Sure. I thought, my goodness, isn't this just wonderful? Um, and I loved the name of them too, so I wanted to share them. Um, in the UK, they coined the term support term support bubbles. And we heard about this for social kind of support. Um, and I, I also heard about it in the context of socialization for, for children. Um, but in the UK, they created support bubbles where two families, particularly where they were um, doing care partnering, would serve one another. And so we, we kept hearing that idea of respite. Um, if there was a family that you trusted that had an individual living with a care need, the care, the primary care partner might step into that role and support your person while you got to step away or vice versa. And I thought, isn't that innovative? And what a wonderful way to stay connected because what we heard over and over again, and I think we heard it in that video was it became a never ending day. And, and for some people that never ending day is continuing. You're, you're doing care tasks or work from sunrise to sunset and sometimes in the middle of the night. So having that opportunity to, to partner and collaborate is really important. Okay. And I know, Kelly, you were going to mention also, you know, how much backup should we have in place in the event of lack of oxygen, right? Like, these are things that we don't need a pandemic, but something else might happen and you don't have your oxygen. And this was something that came up a number of times, actually, as I was um, 
as I was making support calls, supplies. Um, supplies were really an issue. I, I had folks who were running out of wound care supplies. I had folks who were running out of incontinence products. I had a lady who was forced and, and she had a respiratory condition. And because she did not know how to utilize her portable oxygen properly, she went to the emergency room. The last place that we needed that person to be was in the emergency room for a social admission. So as, as professionals really, um, Understanding the buffering effects of education and proactive education on outcomes, making sure that that we are providing that support. And, and what I ended up doing was sending a community health worker to the home to ensure there was education to multiple parties on how to use the portable oxygen. Um, but when we're working with elders, sometimes we have to be creative in the ways that we educate. Um, what she ended up needing was actually a template on, on who to call if the oxygen was running low and on how to implement the oxygen. She did have a cognitive impairment, but she was able to respond to pic pictorial instruction. So I think really digging deep and looking at what's needed and, and how much of what's needed um, is an important piece of this. And I think some other things that we learned with our clients, Kelly, is that it might be the well care partner that needs to go to the hospital. So as you mentioned, sometimes that, you know, caused a social admit. However, if we had this very extended backup plan and who to call so that when EMS or a family member needs to call somebody to step in, they will be ready to go with the the person living with a disability or the cognitive impairment, and it will be seamless for that individual. So some of the things that we were coaching family care partners to do is have a to-go bag ready because we just don't know when something might hit. And in that to-go bag, several things that were mentioned were seven days worth of medications, changes of clothing and toiletries, comforting items, because we do need that engagement still to happen because now the well care partner has stepped out. So there's gonna be that anxiety. We have to be prepared for that. The other thing that we would suggest to care partners often was having something written up a little bit about me, but actually some fun, some engaging, some, you know, items that would be helpful for communication, not just, oh, well, they need to, their brief needs to be changed or they need to be freshened up every two hours. That's not what's going to keep the anxiety down. Give a little bit of the routine and what we did is we put this up on our website you're welcome to download it use it spread it across the world engage your care partners to be prepared that's what we care about so feel free to use this as an example kelly as far as linkage to resources go we we also have a resource list that we're going to be sharing um but i i can't say enough how many care partners cited just being reached out to as a, having a lifeline, just knowing that there was someone in the outside world thinking about them um, as, as being a lifeline. And Nettie, I know you have some, some very cool things to share to let people know that you're thinking about them. Um, with regard to advocacy and community organizing, there are so many opportunities. Uh, we need to get together to look at the disparities in access. We need to be proactive in addressing them. And again, I think about Nettie, the center light example where the, the transportation and custodial staff organized a food pantry. They went to the social work team and said, hey, our members are not, they don't have enough to eat. And they took that initiative and they made it happen. We really need to be asking care partners what they need and engage them in building it. Um, they do they do have the innovative ideas they do have the resources it's up to us to to support them to organize and while many care partners valued the increased time with their loved ones some reported difficulty with stress levels well-designed shared in-home activities can buffer these stress levels by reducing repetitive questions anxiety etc I mean, there's so many different emotions that were happening. They can also bring a richness and fun to the relationship, as you saw with the woman who shared about her knitting and the beanies. Um, there were many, many programs who rose to the occasion and we had a family living at home and the grandchildren were there and the grandchildren were in school. So we had a generation of, they were living in their forties, we had teenagers, and then we had 80 to 90 year olds all living under one roof. And so Kelly and I were taxed with, okay, what resources can we provide? What resources can we provide? Actually meet me at MoMA. 
came through with art making activities families can do at home. And again, it was phenomenal because it engaged all of the generations together. So don't be afraid to reach out to these online resources that are still there. You can still support those care par partners that are living through this um, pandemic. There are so many opportunities out there. And what we've done is we have a resource list again on our website that you can just download it, share with your care partners, use for your own self. Okay. This is one of my favorite things that I think that I've learned out of the pandemic is a way to stay connected. This is actually a light and you buy it. And basically what can happen is you touch the light and the person that also has the light, it lights up in the same color. So if you're feeling blue, you might hit the blue and then your partner who has it, also, it lights up in blue and you immediately have a connection. If you're feeling love, you might hit the red color and then theirs turns up in red. And it's also a nice way if you are wanting to say goodnight to your loved one, but you're too exhausted to get on the phone, you can hit it and then again, have a color that signifies that you're going to sleep. You can use it across generations and across distance. And it's really phenomenal if you'd like to use that. Okay. And so another major theme that came up and, and an area where there are some significant implications, and I think um, Reverend Harper mentioned these as well, there are implications for technology. Um, when we looked at care partner dyads out there, technology had a huge mitigating effect. Um, I'll, I can reference one individual that I worked with. Um, he did not have cognitive change, but he had a history of, of stroke. And at one point during the pandemic, he he called and his home attendant hadn't shown up. He, he didn't have a home, home attendant with him and he wasn't sure whether he was having another stroke. Um, he had a nosebleed and a severe headache and he was trying to get in touch with his doctor and he actually was able, he was, he was not sure whether he should go to the ER because he was fearful. Um, he was able through Sinai visiting docs, they had a grant and they had gotten him a tablet and he was able to jump on the tablet um, he had a pulse ox attached to the tablet. He had a blood pressure cuff attached to the tablet. They were able to assess his vital signs and his doc was able to advise him. Um, and I just can't imagine the relief that he must have felt when he had access to those tools in that setting. Um, with telehealth, people living with dementia may struggle to use telehealth. Um, so it's there are a lot of implications for technology. There are changes in our visual in our visual ability when there's Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, there can be difficulty with reading, there can be increases in double vision, um, also with changes in language and um, processing of auditory input. Um, and so there are implications for making technology more accessible for folks living with dementia. There's also a lot of opportunity for um, work working with older adults who may not have a lot of access or ability with technology. And Nettie and I have had the opportunity to partner with some fantastic, I know Reverend Harper mentioned giving uh, on, the, on the fly uh, tech lessons. I know NYU has a really comprehensive um, opportunity for learning more about technology. Senior Planet has great resources for learning more about technology. And so when it's not an emergent situation is a great time to help gain access to these programs and support people with them. Um, if we can learn about technology now, we can have successes later and with greater ease. And PLWD refers to person living with dementia. Oh, thanks, Nettie, for answering that in the chat. No worries. All right. And then another, another major thing that came up were promoting care partner health and well-being and personal health initiatives. Nettie and I looked at surveys of care partners, what was helpful to them, and they spoke a great deal to those three themes she referenced of con control, uncertainty, the new normal, and adapting to it. Many care partners really thoroughly emphasized the importance of getting outdoors, going for a hike, walking the dog, seeking out nature. And I think for um, many, even with my urban colleagues, I've seen many folks who are looking, how do I get out of the city and get into nature a little bit more? How do I increase my access? Um, many took advantage of the reduced risk of infection by meeting other people outdoors, getting together with close friends that way. 
Physical exercise, huge coping strategy, both for people living with dementia and for care partners. Um, and so when we can't exercise indoor because of limited space, the outdoors became even more important. Um, picnics and walking groups really emulated the socialization that adult day programs supplied, and they did provide some of that buffering effect. Um, so again, the outdoors was something that came up a great deal for all of these kind of coping techniques. Um, and then also, there was a huge emphasis placed on good nutrition. And I think for folks who were working at home, one of the benefits is the access to cooking, right? Sometimes we, we were uh, eating things that were not so healthy, but during the pandemic, there was a little more time to spend on those things for people. And moving forward, decisions about physical environment and an understanding of how important the physical environment is, particularly for people living with dementia. Um, decisions about where to live, who to live, how to live. Um, when we think of the interior space, we had calls from, I, I, one particular call sticks out. It was a woman who was living with her husband. He had dementia with Louis bodies. He had been acting out a dream and he had bitten her in, in his sleep. Um, and the woman was sleeping on the couch. The live-in care partner was sleeping on the floor and the gentleman was sleeping in the bed. We heard many stories like this through the pandemic where there were folks in very small spaces. Um, and I think it drew light on how important physical space is as a component of advanced care planning. Um, so when we're thinking about where to live, a diagnosis of cognitive change can actually inform what the future is going to look like and, and what we need to consider. Um, as far as environmental modifications, things as simple as lighting, templated signage to support people with hand washing and mask wearing, those adaptations became really crucial with buffering the the telling one another what to do. So looking at things like that. And then exterior space. There was a study of 400 survey participants um, and it asked about changes in the personal importance related to um, natural areas. And so 60.9% of respondents had increased or greatly increased visitation to natural areas or urban forests. Um, 80 had 80% had considered the importance of these areas either increased or greatly in increased during the pandemic. And so I think it's really important, again, to look at access to outdoor space. Um, and that may change how we're looking at urban planning moving forward. Okay. This is our last one, Kelly. All right. And so and we just want to we just want to reiterate for our professional colleagues on the call. Um, look to the caregivers. We, we need to do work to empower care partners. If you are a care partner, your story is valuable, your insights are valuable, um, and, and we hold a lot of power together as a community. Um, so again, we really want to emphasize how important it is to hear the voices of care partner dyads, um, engage them in initiatives that are meaningful to them, that are helpful to them, um, and, and help them leverage their own strengths by supplying resources, whether that's through focus groups, committees, legislative action, um, grant programming. We've heard some wonderful grant programs that have empowered care partners. Um, that was the message that we took away from this pandemic, is that the care partners have the answer Answers. They just need the resources. And then finally, it brings us to the resources that I mentioned you're welcome to have. It's uh, it's on our website, and you can get on our website at um, Inspired Memory Care. And it's right on our uh, front page, Palliative Care Conference. Um, you can get to know me. And then the conference resource list. The resource list is everything that we have learned about resources through the pandemic. It's not up for us to keep it. We want to share it because if we share it, we're helping more individuals and that's what we're all here for today. And then if you wanna learn more about um, the research we referenced, we gave you a reference list as well. And I know that the new Jewish home is gonna kindly share our slide deck with everyone. And are there any questions? I know there were two questions that came up. Um, what's the name of the lamp? It's actually simply called the friendship lamp and it's amazing. <laughs> I know we have questions queued up, so let me uh, thank you both, uh, Nettie and Kelly, and uh, hand it over to Leah to facilitate the Q&A. Thank you. 
just as a reminder, you can ask your questions in the Q&A platform or raise your hand. Um, we have a question in the chat here. Could you speak to how best to address caregiver guilt and shame if they're not that they're not able to do enough or to do it successfully and wanting to care give in a new way? Kelly, you want to start and then I'll finish? Sure. With regard to caregiver guilt and, and caregiver shame, um, I, that's such a personal, individualized um, thing. I, I would say it really depends on what the source of, of guilt or shame is. Um, but coming from a place of guilt or shame in anything that we're doing, we're going to be less effective at it. And so I, I think I would want to dig a little bit deeper about about what the source of that of that burnout is or what the source of that guilt or, or shame is. Um, Nettie, I don't know, do you want to expand upon that a little bit further? Yeah, I definitely think it's individualized and then figuring out, like you said, the source, but also, you know, just reflecting, I think, does wonders. I mean, again, we met with a care partner that said, I'm done. I've, I failed. I never fail at anything in my life, but I failed. But then when we sat and we kind of just had space to listen, she she actually started reflecting of everything that she's done so far and she started understanding wow there are reasons i feel this way but there's also reasons that i could be appreciative of what i've done so far and i think they just get to this space where they just can't take it anymore but they haven't been able to kind of i hate to say this word but unload sometimes you just need to unload it and they haven't had that availability. So we do a lot of listening. We don't do a lot of, well, you should do this, you should do this, because every person's individual. Every person's individual. Kelly? And as far as not, thank you for clarifying, not wanting to take on the role, or at least in the new way the pandemic demands, I think the acknowledgement of, of not wanting to do something in and of itself is is a powerful acknowledgement and it's it's a good starting point um you know i i think of folks who even transitioning care Nettie and i look at, at a lot when, when it comes to care partners and um many folks will think the transition to a, a facility setting is a failure of their of their ability to partner for care it's actually not what what research demonstrates is that your care partner relationship continues it continues in a new way and and you never stop being an advocate or a care partner once you have that connection um and and there are also some folks who handing over and and i i kind of like that analogy of when, when you hand some of the responsibility over it allows you to focus your energy in a new direction and and toward a new component of the relationship and i think that that's an important way of reframing for families um as well you know Nettie, i think about the gentleman who said the dynamic with my mother for my entire life has not been healthy and there are pieces of it that i simply cannot do and i i refuse to do um and and he still had some ambivalence about that right and some guilt about it but but acknowledging that this is not my skill set this is not i'm not the most equipped person to do this um that was a huge thing for him i think it's actually um a positive that when you're able to step back and say, I I'm not able to do this role, and then we can brainstorm about the resources that are available. We run into that all the time with our partner ICS. It's Medicaid based. And so often nurses will come in and say, well, there's a family member that lives in the home, so they're not gonna get additional hours. But again, if they're not in the headspace or the physical space to fill that role, we as clinicians need to come up with how can we support with other resources just because they're family members or they're close friends doesn't mean they have to fill that role we've got to understand our abil ability mentally and physically yeah and, and i think i i hear what you're saying Darren, about the, the complications of cultural and religious expectations and you know from a culturally competent standpoint I, again i think i would need to be I would need to understand individually what the culture is or what the what the religion is and and kind of what the framework is that the person is working from but in general I think working on that reframing process and looking at kind of what is the outcome that you want for your loved one and how best do we piece this together so that you can be um as as effective as possible and the outcome for your loved one is going to be the best possible outcome. And, and coming at it from that standpoint, uh, 
you know, I think that's usually kind of where we where we had. Good questions. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question here. Although no one could have predicted living through a pandemic, you touched on the fact that we weren't prepared for such a catastrophe. Now, 21 months into the pandemic, do you think we have learned enough to be prepared for the next unknown crisis? A very big question. I would like to say, let's plan our next steps right now because sometimes we'll get complacent. You know, after a big event, a big tragedy, a big, like significant something, and then everything's stable again, we don't move things forward. We're like, oh, well, we, we got through it. We need to take action now. Let's get the top organizations and start doing focus groups with our care partners, right? Focus on what, what caregiving needs now, because it's fresh in their mind right now, and they're still living through it. What we can't do is be complacent. We've got to act now. So do I think that we're ready? I'm never going to say we're ready because I always feel that we as clinicians and as care partners, we want more and we need more. We deserve quality living for all of our individuals that are living with disabilities as well as our own mental capacity. So I'm going to say let's keep moving forward and collaborating together. Kelly? Yeah, and I would say the collaboration piece is the most important piece. I think that we don't know what the next catastrophe, I mean, there could be a drought and I can tell you to have enough supplies, how much water do you need in the event of a long-standing drought? We don't know, but what we do need to, to have are those lines of communication open and fortified and the resources and connections made. And I think, Nettie, that speaks to exactly what you were saying. Yeah. There, and, and through our course of our work, we're able to collaborate with a lot of organizations. And so often we're like, if I could just piece these pieces together, we'd have a perfect opportunity for so many clients. Because, you know, the New Jewish Home has done a wonderful program with um, working on recruiting uh, uh, CNAs. Does everybody know about it? They should, right? Uh, we mentioned Centralite. Does everybody know what they did with their food pantry? If they don't, they should. But piecing everything together, Wow, what a beautiful collaboration we would have. Thank you. And yes, that's our geriatrics career development program, and it is a wonderful <laughs> program. I <laughs> Thank love you for it. bringing that up. It's fantastic. <laughs> I love it too. Yes. Um, our next question that we have. Although most services have resumed to normal function, do you think the absence of services such as care attendance, physical therapy and day programs during the peak of this pandemic cause permanent damage to clients? Undoubtedly, in, in some situations, undoubtedly. Yeah. We see it with our clients, absolutely, absolutely. And But that goes to show, like, so when we're looking at this collaboration, how do we make sure that PT can still be significant even virtually? And we saw it, we just need to make sure it was so what we found is we, we partner with um, a physical therapy department. So we knew what the abilities were for them, but family care partners, it wasn't well known to them. So we've got to make sure everybody knows about it. And those are the positive things that we wanted to see on the news too, and, and, and really spreading that word so that we could get the resources to them quickly. Thank you. We have one more. What have you perceived as the most positive outcome of the pandemic, the silver linings, if you will? Do you want to go first, Nadia, or do you want me to go? We have different ones. Go ahead. I think the intense surge in creativity and um, resourcefulness is is one of my silver linings that I've seen, I, I think of Nettie, the story time. Um, just everyday folks living at home with their kids and everyday folks living at home with their loved ones living with cognitive change coming together through a Facebook group where the folks with cognitive change read stories to kids online to, to create an intergenerational connection. Programs like that to me, speak to folks um, just coming together and 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 thinking about what matters most and and really uh, dedicating themselves to making it happen. And I thought that that was a testament to creativity and and to the power of just everyday folks. Yeah, 
I, the pure innovation that happened and just watching so many programs build out of this um, was amazing. And Kelly and I, myself, uh, for Inspired Memory Care, we are reaching people all over the world now. It's not just New York City. And that is a gift that I don't think I would ever regret. You know, like we pivoted. It was, like I said, we went into this paralysis state at, in the beginning, like, Nothing's gonna work, this is awful. We all went through that, right? And we're still going through it, but we pivoted and we have so many more relationships with clients, family care partners and colleagues that are just deeper in meaning. Thank you so much. And we appreciate the questions and your presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Rabbi Malami. Thank you uh, to Nettie, Kelly and Leah. What a, a vital conversation this is. Um, and what an enriching first half of our conference. Uh, thanks to Nettie Harper and Kelly Gilligan for mapping out this landscape and, um, and sharing your resource-rich tour of the complexities of caregiving and care receiving uh, through the long haul of the pandemic. Uh, 